Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and to this event with the great literary heavyweight, Howard Jacobson. <laughs> I'm Jackie McLone, a journalist, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Howard to you this afternoon. So welcome, Howard, um, the self-described Jewish Jane Austen. <laughs> a writer and broadcaster, Howard was born in Manchester and educated at Cambridge University. He's published 16 novels, including 2010's Booker Prize winning The Finkler Question, Shylock Is My Name in 2016, and Pussy in 2017. Forget Pussy. <laughs> well, I did want to say a furious political allegory responding to the Donald Trump situation. All right, that's fair enough, and now can we forget okay, it? Okay, we've forgotten it. Okay, okay. Howard's also a renowned columnist and a journalist, and a collection of his journalism, Whatever It Is, I Don't Like It, came out in 2011. He has taught at the universities of Sydney and Selwyn College, Cambridge. He comes to us today, though, with his latest book, The Wonderful Live a Little. This life-enhancing novel has won rave reviews, which we shall discuss. It tells of two characters, Beryl Dusenbury, who is in her 90s and forgetting things in her grand London flat where the en suites <coughs> excuse me, have en suites. On the shabbier side of Finchley Road lives a nonagenarian Shimmy Carmelli, Carmelli, a timid, guilt-ridden bachelor who remembers everything and wishes he could forget. No other novelist writing in Britain could dramatize this nonagenarian love story with greater verve and tenderness, wrote the Observer Critic, while the Times reviewer wrote that this book is alive, it pulses with warmth and intelligence, and unusually for a novel about old age, it has a lot of style. Jacobson's sentences are as dapper as Shimmy's refined wardrobe. Beryl says of him, he's the only adult male I have ever met who doesn't doubt he's half the time ridiculous. A magnificent declaration of love if ever there was one. Howard and I are going to discuss the book. He will read from it and we will take your questions. And afterwards, he will be signing in the Edinburgh Gin Cafe and signing tent, um, which is just on the left as we leave. Before we begin, please, no photography. And um, may I remind you to switch off mobile phones. And should you wish to tweet about the event, please do so only after the lights go up. So, ladies and gentlemen, Howard Jacobson. So I'm going to read a little, yes? Yes, please. Okay. I wonder if I might stand. I think I might. I'll just read a little bit. I just want to say hello, really. It's very nice coming here because I feel um, this sounds like a schmooze, and I don't say this at every festival I go to. I truly don't. I only say it at this one. I do feel I'm here um, seeing people that I know well, and there's a lovely continuity here. So um, thank you for coming again, and thank you for doing what you do every year, which is to buy up to six books each. <laughs> Just a couple of things before I read now, because sometimes people, this, this is not necessary here because you are such intelligent readers. In fact, I think you are probably the only intelligent readers that I have, so I don't need to say what I'm going to say. But Beryl, the protagonist, the 90-year-old preposterous woman, is not me. Um, and her views are not my views. Um, and, the, and the only other thing I want to say, because Beryl is, this is a novel about carers, partly. Um, I just want to say that no carers were injured in the writing of this book. <laughs> she has two carers. One is called Euphoria, who is from Africa, and the other one is called Nastia, who is from somewhere in Eastern Europe, and Beryl can't be bothered finding out which, where. Now that, the princess tells Euphoria, suits you very well. Sorry, I should say, the princess is Beryl's name. She calls herself the Princess Schweppes Sodawasser. Um, <laughs> and she calls herself the princess lots of other things. She's, oh, she, uh, 
partly because she likes tormenting her sons. Um, she doesn't like her sons. She doesn't like their children. She doesn't like children at all. She doesn't like the men that she married. She's had a lot of marriages. She doesn't like her lovers. She doesn't like, well, she doesn't really like anybody, which is why when she meets Shimmy, it's so wonderful for her. But here she is with her, with her carers. Now that, the princess tells Euphoria, suits you very well. I'm not sure about its appropriateness for helping me into the bathroom, but you could certainly meet the queen in it. <laughs> Euphoria practices a curtsy. That's what I bought it for, Mrs. Beryl. And where are you anticipating meeting the queen? Underneath my bed. The princess's sarcasm is lost on Euphoria. No, Mrs. Beryl, in her house. What, she's offered you a job? No, no, I'm very happy working for you. I'm only going for tea. Having said which, she draws from her floral handbag an official invitation to one of the Queen's summer garden parties. Is that from Primark, the princess asks. <laughs> Euphoria looks with consternation at the invitation. No, not that. I mean the bag. Anyway, show me. Euphoria shows the princess her bag. No, not that. The invitation. In her confusion, Euphoria drops the invitation and has difficulty retrieving it. So tight is her skirt. You'd better not drop anything in front of Prince Philip, the princess says. <laughs> she scrutinizes the invitation from the Lord Chamberlain with a degree of annoyance. She has herself been invited to Buckingham Palace only four times, and that, given her venerable age and connections, is a paltry number compared to Euphoria's once, allowing that Euphoria has neither venerable age nor connections. And what public service have you performed that explains this invitation, she asks. Euphoria shines with pride. My husband is a fireman. Is this a garden party for firemen? <laughs> he risked his life rescuing a baby. The princess wrinkles her nose. So now explain to me why you have come here wearing the dress you mean to see the queen in. Are you planning to go there after work? It will be late for a garden party. I was hoping for your advice, Mrs. Beryl, Nastia says. Sorry, I was hoping for your advice, Mrs. Beryl. Nastia says that when it comes to royal protocol, you are the one to ask. Are you telling me that you and that Moldovan trollop sit in my kitchen discussing royal protocol? <laughs> Euphoria covers her face with the invitation from the Lord Chamberlain. Not all the time, Mrs. Beryl. <laughs> Nastia has been listening to the above conversation from the kitchen. Well, I think you look smart enough to meet Queen, she says, the moment she has the chance to talk to Euphoria on her own. So does Mrs. Beryl. No, Mrs. Beryl patronise you. You are cheap adventure for, uh, for her eyes. You are package holiday. That's how the English see black people. She said my dress was beautiful. Yes, for black person. Well, I am a black person. Not in the way you're a black person for Mrs. Beryl. I have boyfriend reading book about Western people looking down on culture of Eastern people by admiring it. Appreciating us is new form of imperialism. <laughs> I'm not Eastern. We are all Eastern people to Western people. Well, I'm still wearing this dress for the garden party. You should, but don't let Queen insult you by saying you look nice. You tell her she look nice first. <laughs> Do you have a message for her? Nastia thinks about it. Tell her days of cultural appropriation over and ask her if she has a spare prince I can marry. In order to prove her point about Mrs. Beryl's condescension to the exotic, Nastia turns up to work the following week in Moldovan national dress. <laughs> Mrs. Beryl is going to rave about it, she tells Euphoria. How I look, she asks her employer with a twirl. Like shit, the princess says. <laughs> Howard, I think everyone who's not read the book, who's here, will now know that Beryl is not the most politi politically correct of characters. Where did she spring from? Well, you could say she sprang from my unconscious or the national unconscious, since we are all somewhat oppressed at the moment by having to be careful what we say. So it, you could, say, could argue that there is a need for someone who makes, who makes it possible for us not to care what we say. Uh, she's, she's, a liberating, she's a liberating presence. Where she came from, for me, writing about it, I've no idea. She sprang. I mean, I say that she sprang out. You know the, you know the famous 
the famous portrait of Venus rising out of the water, naked. Beryl, age 90, rose from the sea, not naked, fully dressed, but she just rose. She truly did. Writers talk about how characters come to them as though there's, there are kind of mysteries and miracles. There are mysteries and miracles. You don't know where characters come from. The best ones are not characters you know you're in charge of. They just come, and she just came like that. I don't know why she came like that, but she came. And the minute she came, I thought, I like this woman more than I've ever liked anybody else. Maybe she came from, from you know, my, my own... Is it possible that all along I have been a 90-year-old woman in the body of a young man? <laughs> and not such a young man, not such a young man either. But I felt a kind of, I felt that I, she isn't based on anybody. On the other hand, there are lots of, there are people I've met, there are women I've met, and there are women I've heard about who've informed her. I've talked to lots of women, and in, uh, I'm old now, so I've lived a long life, and I've talked to lots of women, and I've heard lots of women tell me what they think of, well, me, um, or, or men. I've heard women be very, very insulting about men. Um, so I had a whole armory of things for Beryl to say about men. Women have, can be very, very funny about men. It doesn't strike you as very funny when you're the object of their derision at the time, but years later when you've forgotten their name, um, it's, kind of it's kind of fun to think about it. So she, came, she comes laden with kind of second-hand experience I've had, and <coughs> the fact that she was not me, or not a version of me, uh, and not a man, because in the past I've really, men have always been at the center because I've always felt I know men better than I know women. Now I'm wondering if I, if I do. Um, and, I've, and I just loved her, I loved writing as a, in fact, you know, I'm prepared to make this promise here now that I will never again write about anybody on the 90 um, and not a woman. <laughs> this limits the field a bit, but. <laughs> will there be a sequel? My wife wants me to write a sequel. My wife wants me to, I mean, every morning when we talk about it, because we, we kind of you know, discuss how is it, how, how's it going, how do you feel today about your book? She says, you still want to kill yourself? And I go, no, <laughs> I'm feeling okay. Because you do want to kill yourself after you've written a book, because it's always anticlimactic. Even after that, I mean, I've written 16 novels and, and numerous other books, and they still never live up to what you hope they're going to be, because you, I'm still, I think, and all writers are like this, naive enough to think that the world will be a different place when your book comes out. The world will just somehow or other not be the world it was before. I don't mean, you know, I'm going to change Brexit or anything, if, I, if, I, if only, but the, the, just the universe will feel different. The sun will shine differently, and it doesn't. Um, and then the reviews come in, and I try not to read the reviews. You've read me words I'd never heard. I didn't know, that, not bad. Um, <laughs> and people tell you, my wife says, you've had some good reviews, and I go, yeah, yeah, um, you keep them. And my agent rings, and my publisher rings, and they say you've had good reviews. I've never had a good review in my life. I've never had a good review. Because a good review isn't, that was a quite nice thing. A good review is only, this is the greatest <laughs> novel that's ever been written. <laughs> If you're going to read anything for the rest of your life, only read books by this person. No other book is worth reading. Go to your library and remove from your shelves all books except those written by Howard Jacobson. And until I get a review like that, <laughs> sister, who cares? So, in the more, so my wife says, are you okay now? Are you getting over the bitter disappointment of, ha of having had very, very good reviews, but not the greatest reviews that have ever been written? And I say, I'm not too bad. And she says, well, what about a sequel? So I'm thinking about a sequel. I've got, the problem is, what do you make happen between two 90-year-olds who've just sort of fallen for each other? That's, that's, my, that's not your problem. That's, that's my problem. And I'm, wor I'm working on it. I th if, this book, if this book does OK, and it's only been out about a month, um, and there is a passion to learn more about them, um, then, yeah. So who came first, Shimmy or Beryl? Shimmy came first because I began by thinking I've reached an age now, it's old man territory now, I'm in old man territory and I must do the humiliations of being an old man, particularly, you know, the stuff, you all, you're all quite young. Um, <laughs> I'm the oldest, I'm always the oldest person at a, um, at a book festival and that's kind of comforting in a way because it means I have wisdom. That you. <laughs> I've been places you've not been, so I can tell you things that you, you, know, you don't know about yet. 
Um, and I wanted to write about you know, the old man's experience. Particularly, I just thought there would be a, a sort of, for me, it would be a relief, a lightish comedy in the whole business of that stuff, for example, of um, Shimmy likes to go walking. He lives in North London and he likes to go walking from park to park in North London. But now, because of the state of things, he has to know where all the public toilets are, or in every park. Um, I'm not saying this is me, but it <laughs> I've got friends. <laughs> and he doesn't only have to know, so he has a little map with the, the toilets in. But you also, it's not just enough to know where the toilets, you have to have the right change to get into each of them. So you have to know which one takes 20p, which one takes 50p, and so on. So you can't leave the house, Jimmy, Jimmy can't leave the house without his map of toilets in North London and the right change in each pocket for getting into And I thought there could be, could be fun writing about that. Uh, but it got too, too light, really. We didn't have enough blood and tragedy in it for me. And I, started, I put the, was about to put the thing aside. I thought, no, this is too light a novel. And then she rose from the waters and uh, more or less saying, yes, it is too light a novel, and you're now going to do something, you might want to do something funny, but you're going to do something much more weightily funny, much more tragic, um, uh, much more rude, um, much more testing. So she took over. Um, Shimmy is um, a bit of an elderly babe magnet, isn't he, for the widows of North London? Yeah, well... <laughs> Will you explain why? Well, he's the only one, I mean, they, they notice that his hands don't tremble, and they think that's fantastic. <laughs> um, and he's the only one that can, that can still walk at 90 without the aid of a stick, um, able to do up his own fly fronts. <laughs> this is no small achievement. And he can speak without spitting. <laughs> and this makes him quite a catch. You <laughs> He's also um, a cartomancer. Would you tell us about cartomancy, please? Because he lives above a Chinese restaurant. Yeah, there. what he does is he he's, doesn't really have a job. But what he does is he's too, he doesn't need a job anymore. He's not got money, but he's got enough to live on. But he entertains. He goes from table to table at a Chinese restaurant, one of these old-fashioned Chinese restaurants, which you get out of the center of a city. And he goes from table to table doing, doing card I got this idea from my father, who used to do it. My father used to do card tricks um, at a Chinese restaurant in Manchester. Um, I didn't know he was doing that, so imagine, imagine what it was like when I go one day and I take a girlfriend, I'm a young man, and I take a girlfriend <laughs> to the Kwok Man Chinese restaurant in Manchester, and suddenly there's my father <laughs> dealing out cards. <laughs> in front of me, and winking at me, like, don't let on. <laughs> And the girl says, why is that man winking at you? <laughs> so I'm thinking, do I tell her it's my father? Do I not say it's my father? So the absurdity of that stayed with me. Cartomancy is a bit like the tarot. Um, he d I've decided I didn't want Shimmy to do card tricks. I wanted him to tell fortunes. It's a version of the tarot. And I wanted him to tell fortunes because cartomancy is something he becomes interested in when he's, young, when he's quite young because he's done something as a young man of which he's profoundly ashamed. We won't tell them what it is, but it's something of a vaguely sexual nature of which he's profoundly ashamed, profoundly ashamed. And he kind of is very interested in, in any, anything that might help to explain why he is the way he is. And he would like to think it's not just his character that's to blame. Could it be written in the stars that he would do this thing? Um, so that's why he's interested in all that. But this thing that he did, which resulted in um, a falling out with his father, who he was certain had probably seen this happening, or maybe his brother had seen this particular what other people would think of as a minor sexual um, uh, offence. But for him, it's everything. And it's ruined his life, really, because he's just ashamed of himself. I like writing about shame. I was a shamed boy. I was ashamed every day. I was a every day I was a when I was a little boy, I was ashamed. Um, and a Why? lot of my heroes... Why? Because I was a little boy. <laughs> and I did things that little boys do. Um, and I wanted to be not be a little boy. Um, I wanted to be, I always wanted to be old, actually. So I've got, I've got what I wanted. <laughs> it's been a long wait, but I got what I wanted. And I actually do think that's why I became a writer. 
I became a writer because I discovered that if I, if I wrote about, from quite an early age, really, from seven or eight, if I wrote a little essay or a little story or even a little poem about something that had shamed me or something, someone that I'd done something that I was ashamed of or somebody had humiliated me, um, if I wrote a story about it, particularly a funny story about it, I could beat it because comedy had that writing about a thing, particularly with, with, a, with a, the comic zest, means you've beaten the experience. It's a way of saying, look, I know what a fool I've been. I know how, you know, I know how mortified I felt. I understand the nature of my own shame and therefore, therefore I win. So that for me was if I ever had a motivation uh, for writing, that was it. But I also want a kind of light writing about male shame particularly because I think it's not talked about enough. There is an idea of men as a swaggering, as a swaggering gender, I think beneath the swagger there is, one can only talk for oneself and the, and, the, and the people you've known closely. But my sense is that beneath male swagger, there's quite a lot of mortification. Now, we've talked about writing in a woman's voice. Do you think that um, given the present climate, um, you, any man could write this way about women, the way that Beryl talks about men? Well, no one could do it as well as I can, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> But do I have a right That's to... That's a given. Ab yes. <laughs> do I have a right to... Absolutely. A writer has a right to do whatever he likes within the book. Mm -hmm. Outside of the book, he's bound by the laws of civil society. Inside the book, where the imagination is free, you can do what you like. You can be who you like. You can write about what you like. You can imaginatively go where you like. And there is absolutely no, you know, there's, I accept no ifs or buts about that. This is the whole point of the world of the imagination. The world of the imagination is free. We can go where we want to go and let no one tell you otherwise. And that's complete nonsense that you don't go there and you don't go there. I mean, hence the joke that I make about it there about cultural appropriation and things. That's the whole point of the imagination, that you enter into what somebody else's life. That's, in fact, it's a positive duty for a man to imagine what it's like to be a woman or a person from another country. And it's a positive duty for a woman to imagine the same about a man and things. That's what, we, that's what it's for. And that's why never, I think, was imaginative literature, poetry, the drama, or particularly, I think, the novel, because the novel is my thing and I love it. Never was it more important, I think, than when we're in a, in a world of guardedness like this and in vigil moral invigilation. The, 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 the art will not tolerate that. Art is a free country. What, what, what do you think about the fact that we are now, we've now got to be careful about whether we write he, she, oh. they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The hours that go into this, the hours and hours that go into this, he, he or she, he or she is terrible, slows the prose down, and then people have started to do they, so that a singular person is now referred to as they in the second clause, and that's not going to work. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, I won't, uh, and I won't give you the name or the gender, did such and such the other day. They. You look at that, they? I thought you said a friend. But of course, bec we can't say now he or she anymore, so it's they. It's in stylistically vile. Um, so I have this little battle all the time. And sometimes I, 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 I have a man from America who writes and tells me, just, just I get an email, you lost the battle. You lost the battle today. That means he caught me saying they. And then I'm very ashamed and think I mustn't lose the battle or he'll spot me. So then I'll put he, and then I'll get another email from, from a woman reader saying, I love your work, but you know, there's not only men in the world and you just... <laughs> then you start thinking, is there any way in which I could write a novel without there ever being a pronoun? Someone once wrote a novel without the letter E. Um, <laughs> That would have taken a long time, but a novel, but a novel without a pronoun would probably take even even longer. But that's the point of Beryl. That's the joy of Beryl, because yep. Beryl wouldn't care. No, no, no. Beryl's not. I mean, I've had to rewrite one or two of the things that Beryl says for my American publishers. At one point, when Beryl says, uh, "Oh, that was the black one," we can't can't have that. We can't have that. So I said, "Okay." Finally, I thought, "Do I want a major fight with?" Um, my American publishers so that I can say that thing. So, okay, I do what you shouldn't do. I, I, gave, in to, I gave in to that degree of, of censorship. 
with, a, with a, an aching heart, I gave into it. I thought, okay. And then they came back and they said, and there's another thing that Beryl says to Shimi. Shimi is, Shimi is half Jewish. It's not a Jewish novel. Um, uh, Shimi is half Jewish, and at one point, Beryl talks about him as a Jew boy. Mm. And they said, we can't have that. And I said, I can write Jew boy. I can have a woman calling a man a Jew boy. I am allowed to do that. If anybody's going to be annoyed, I'll be annoyed. I'm not annoyed, so I can do it. So they kind of, <laughs> that's how you stand up to them. Um, you, you mentioned, the, uh, obviously, there's the battle with, with uh, language and so on, but um, what about the battle to, for um, comic, literary fiction that is comic to be taken seriously? Because I guess w when Finkler questioned one, you thought maybe that was it, the battle is won. That has been the battle of my life, actually. Um, and it's partly my own doing because I go unnecessarily sensitive. I'm the one that decides as I sit at my desk that I really in each day and I, you know, and I write three sentences and I haven't made myself laugh. I'm the one that says there's something wrong here. I haven't found the joke. Because comic writing, like all writing, is finding something that's there in language. You're finding things. You're inventing, but you're finding things. You are in, this is what's so important about writing. You are in a, collaboration when you're if you're a writer you're in a collaboration with words in the same way that a painter is in a collaboration with color and so and the and the words that you use are not yours you you may have a characteristic vocabulary or a style or intonation but the words have been used by millions of other people in different contexts and sometimes if you've read a lot so i hear shakespeare's words all the time sometimes i find i've just written a shakespeare play and i think that's a that looks like the best thing I've ever done. What a pity somebody else had done it before me. <laughs> but you hear Shakespeare, and I hear Dickens, and I hear Georgia, and I hear Jane Austen, and you're in that kind of, and you're in that conversation with them. And in the same way, comedy exists in language. The possibility of verbal play exists within words themselves, puns and things like that, and echoes. So you're finding them. Um, and I love that. I love the finding them, the tears that there is in language, and the, the laughter that there is in, language and then sometimes in my early career I thought maybe I'm too interested in finding or letting find me that the laughter that there is in language um, but I'm not happy if I haven't made myself laugh a few times when I'm writing in a day and then but then when people call me a comic writer I get very annoyed because I feel that they've if they don't call me a comic writer I say they've got no sense of humor and if they call me a comic writer I say they've got no understanding of how language <laughs> works and things so it's not easy. I'm not an easy person to praise. Actually, I'm a dead easy person to praise. You just say you've just written the greatest book that anybody's ever written, <laughs> and I'm praised, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm happy. But it is a fight. It is a fight because our literary culture is very sanctimonious these days. It's very pious. The church went into literature. You know those country clergymen that Jane Austen's heroines always say no to because they're pompous and proper. They all became, when the church more or less lost its life, they all became literary critics. <laughs> you're right for the Times Literary Supplement, they are, they become judges for the Booker Prize, that's where you, that's where you will find them all. And they have no sense of humor, and they fear jokes, and they fear that jokes, even the most, even the most finely wrought joke, breaks the trance. It's like, what's that thing about a right, a pistol shot going off in a concert? And even sometimes when they laugh, they feel the minute they have laughed themselves, if somehow or other you can make them laugh, and that's not easy, but if you can make them laugh, the minute they laugh themselves, they feel what you've done has lost its, has, it's lost its, what's the word, gravitas. Um, whereas I think that, you know, the, the thing we call gravitas, the seriousness of a work of literature um, is not affected by, well, it is affected to this degree by comedy, that the really serious books all have comedy in them. Because comedy is, we all know that, we all, the importance of laughter to us, the importance of jokes, the importance of mirth and irony, the whole s spectrum of stuff, very important to the way we live our lives and think about everything. We must dispense with it in art. Well, we don't. The greatest writers are, Van Dostoevsky's funny, Tolstoy's funny, Dickens, as we know, is very funny. Shakespeare is, Shakespeare is fun. It doesn't take from, comedy doesn't take from, sorry, I become a comedy bore about this <laughs> because I feel it's been the battle of my life sometimes and there's no questions there's no when I won the Booker Prize for the Finkler question it was the wrong book 
You don't say no. You don't go, thank you very much, but I don't want you to give me that. You've got, you take it when you get it. But I wrote books which I thought were richer than the Finkler question, but they were funnier. And because they were funnier, they were not. It, it's not the same panel of judges each time. Of course it's not. It's all a matter of luck who you get. What you want, I find, if any of you are, are working on a novel and you're wondering how it's going to go with a big prize, hope to God you've got a poet on the judging panel. Poets are very good, because poets hear the words. And those who aren't poets go on about stories and themes, you know, and is it, is it politically correct? And it's absolute nonsense to do with it. But a poet listens to the words, and if you're writing novels, you're dealing with so you want so you want a poet. And poets are very good, in my experience, poets are very good about seriousness and comedy. They understand how the two go together. Sorry, I'm sorry to have gone about. I've talked to I've talked to this. I can see people here looking at me, saying, "You've said this to me." <laughs> On your last ten visits to Edinburgh, you've made this point. <laughs> have you not matured yet out of that? The answer is no, I haven't. Uh, Howard, before we take audience questions, uh, one last question from me. Um, you said it's not a Jewish novel, but I'd like your thoughts on the unstoppable rise of um, anti-Semitism in the UK, oh, which you beggars belief. Yes, do please. You, wanna, you, know, you don't want to hear it. Um, it beggars belief. Yeah. Or I wrote a, I wrote a novel it? called Jay. Yes, I didn't I talk to you about Jay, did I? No, but I came here and talked about Jay. Jay was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Shortlisted. They dared to just shortlist. <laughs> Jay was a dyst dystopian novel about a world in which Jews had finally been removed. Mm. Um, and the bitter irony in about Jay was once Jews had been removed from the world, the world suddenly feels there's some, something missing. And by that I don't mean people who, you know, who, um, people who tell jokes or write Jewish novels. I mean the people with whom the rest of the world argue. Jews have been very important people to argue with. For a long time, it was you know, very much understood in the 16th and 17th century, Christianity worked itself out in relation to, to Jewishness. In what way was it or wasn't it Jewish? In what, 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 uh, what did Christianity owe to Judaism? What did Christianity wish it didn't owe to Judaism? And so on. It's been very important, Judaism, to the way in which the, the, the European Christian world, at least, has thought about itself. And once, once Christianity isn't there, as has happened on occasions, the Christian world goes into a panic. It happened when the Jews were emptied out of Spain and Portugal in the, in the late 15th century. Anti they got the Jews out. All the Jews were gone. No more anti-Semitism. It's not true. There was still anti-Semitism. I've discovered something about, something interesting about anti-Semitism. It doesn't need Jews. <laughs> it ex somehow or other, it exists prior to Jews. There was this thing called anti-Semitism. Jews came along, they'll do. They put the, put the anti-Semitism onto the Jews. When you think that Marlowe wrote The Jew of Malta mm. and Shakespeare wrote not long afterwards The Merchant of Venice, which we have talked about together, and he wrote The Merchant of Venice because The Jew of Malta had done so well, and Shakespeare's theatre company said, OK, we've got to do as well as Marlowe's done. Marlowe's done down the road. So a few years later, Shakespeare wrote The Jew of Malta because there was this intense interest in Jews and in Jew baiting, though I don't think the, the, um, the Shakespeare is an anti-Semitic play, by the way, nor is the Jew of Malta, really, it's just fun. But there was an intense interest in, in Elizabethan England in the subject of Jews. There were none there. They'd gone. They'd been expelled 300 years ago. Maybe a couple of hundred had crept in. No one knows if Shakespeare ever met a Jew, probably didn't. But there was this antagonism towards Jews. That, so it has made me feel, that's why I wrote Jay, that there would kind of never be a time when there would not be some sort of antagonism mm. to do, sometimes quite a rich and creative antagonism, but also the other thing. Mm. So back it is, and it's horrifying. Mm. And I suppose the really horrifying thing is you would have thought that 50 years, 60 years after the Holocaust, they could give it a rest. Mm. Just a bit. <laughs> not a long time, a hundred years, come back in a hundred years with all the things you want to say, but no, there it still, there it still is, and it's horrifying. But what else am I going to say? Thank you. Subject? Well, we'll take some more uh, questions from you, please. So um, put your hands up. There are rovering microphones, so wait until the microphone gets to you. Um, please. Yeah. Thank you. So pointing. Um, I would like to know, when you sell the film rights for your novel, who do you 
Who would you like to see play the respective roles? Shimmy and Beryl. Are you putting in for a part? <laughs> <laughs> well, you look a little young to me. It's a long way you. back, I, and my I'm sight's not as good. I'm grateful you said that. I'm grateful you said that. Well, it's funny because already I've, I mean, I won't may name, name any names, but already I have had a, a very distinguished actress suggest she might be good in the role and then suggest the name of another very good actress who might want it even more than she does and generously might be better than her. But I don't have a great experience of my books being turned into films or plays. I think the feeling is I have too many words. Um, and I don't have enough, you know, there are no, I don't have, I don't, I, some of you may have noticed, I, there are no detectives in my novels. <laughs> and no guns. No gun has ever gone off in my novel. And if you don't have a gun or a detective, who want, they don't want to know. But I suspect there could be a little bit more. Uh, the Mighty Walser, my novel about table tennis, the novel that you think would be the least the least are likely to make it, did, did become a play for a little while. It was on in Manchester, and that was fun. But otherwise... No, people say this would be terrific and they would like to do this and they give me a cheque for 250 quid and they keep the book for a year and then it's forgotten about. But maybe with this one, and, but I'm, we, we are, my people are talking to your people <laughs> right now. Can, can I just say, no guns went off in the lady in the van. So be hopeful. Thank you, I will, I will. <laughs> I remember thinking with the lady in the van, I got a bit bored towards the end. I wished a gun had gone off. <laughs> <laughs> Hands up. And we've got someone right at the front, please. Uh, thank you. I know the, the Queen makes uh, an appearance in the, the excerpt that you wrote. I'm thinking of Sue Townsend's The Uncommon Reader, where the Queen is a major uh, element in, in the whole novel. Is anything off limits? No. <laughs> no. Well, the Queen certainly isn't off limits, no. But, I mean, I thought for one moment you were going to suggest she should play Beryl. <laughs> She'd do it very well, actually. <laughs> and since we, since we could just be about to enter a constitutional crisis <laughs> in which the Queen decides, to hell on you all, I'm resigning, I could say, and have I got a part for you, Your Majesty? <laughs> please, I can't see. Oh, there's someone and over, over here. here, please. Thank you. It's just a postscript to the um, mighty Walser. Uh, the U3A in Edinburgh has become quite keen on. Um, table tennis and we we did have a 90 year old who came along to play who hadn't played for 70 years but she soon got the hang of it i don't know if she if she ever thinks of acting is she still playing i wouldn't mind playing her actually <laughs> how's her backhand I have table tennis friends in this order. There are, there are, I have table tennis friends in Edinburgh, and I was, in fact, um, emailed by some of them only the other day saying, if you've got time, let's have a game. That's serious. Unfortunately, I haven't got time. But if you are here, my table tennis friends, yes, um, that game is still on. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. I was very interested to hear what you said about male shame. Um, I don't know why it appealed to me, that uh, topic. But um, I just wonder whether we live in a time where there's some men who don't feel enough shame. Um, I'm thinking of certain prominent politicians on either side of the Atlantic. And do you think there are some people who just don't feel the shame that you talked about and have been driven by? It's a nice point, isn't it? It's a nice point if one could argue, and I think I, I would agree with you, that shame, what, if one could show that shame actually is a virtue. That's what Beryl thinks. It's a, it's a virtue in, in Shimmy to feel the shame. Maybe he's overdone it, f um, feeling that his whole life has been ruined by this minor act, but still shame is virtue. I agree with you. Um, I, think it is, I think it is inexplicable, really, that... Things are proven against politicians over there and over here, which certainly in my lifetime they would have resigned for 
at one point. You wonder now, what is a resigning offence? What do you have to do now to feel that, you know, in, in all decency, you cannot go on? I think that's, I think shame as a, as a sense of virtue and a sense of what you owe the public you represent, I think that's gone. It would be very interesting to know why it's gone. But yes, I agree with you. I think without shame, we are the poorer, morally and ethically the poorer. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree with you about the importance of humor uh, in literature, and I'm wondering if you have any writers other than yourself in particular who, and contemporary writers who you think mix humor with profundity in a way that matters to you and, and that you would recommend. Um, <laughs> I have a thing about contemporary writers. Uh, I don't notice them. Um, I, I can say this to you because we have a long and honest and, you know, ex exchange of views, and I know that you won't go out and blab this <laughs> to the press. But I will tell you what some other writers maybe won't tell you. Living, writers don't like other writers. Um, in the main, writers don't read other writers. There's a reason for that. It's a very, very s serious writers anyway. We're all fishing in a very small pool. Um, there's, there's very, very, the rewards are small, and you can't, any other writer takes your reader. If I hear that there's another, uh, another writer that sounds anything like me, I'd think, that's my 10 readers, gone, gone to him. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to do is to read them, um, and I'm certainly not going to recommend them. I have, <laughs> I have a, this is a very, very simple rule. It's a rule anybody can obey it. Um, the minute they die, you're interested in them again. <laughs> so I can talk to you, you know, about, you know, Philip Roth died last year, wonderful writer, funny writer, <laughs> fantastic. Saul Bellow, the same. But the living, one, the living ones are too problematic. Yes, please. Um, what you said about the anticlimactic feeling you'd had as soon as your book is published, presumably if you had that the first time you had a novel published, what drives you on to write the next and the next? You think it's going to change. <laughs> you think it's going to change an insane hope builds up in you. Text can take a little while, but this insane hope builds up in you that this time, this time it will be different. And and also, you know, once I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be cynical about it all. The truth is, there's also, I very much believe in the importance of the, the thing that I do beyond myself. There is the self and the desire for vain glory, which I've talked to you about, and I know you'll be, you know, decent about and not laugh at me for or scorn me for, but beyond the, beyond the personal vain glory, I just think it's a very important thing to do. Um, I don't think as I start a new book, I've, uh, the, the world will, will be the better for, f for my new book. But I do feel, I mean, I was a teacher for, for many years, and I don't even want to say I write out of some edu educative impulse. That wouldn't be true either. But there is that feeling that it's just terribly important when you're living in a world where what you mean by language is not what a lot of people mean by language. Um, that you go on standing up for the thing that you mean. The point, about, the point about the making of art is its discovery. When you make a work of art, you discover something. You don't know what you mean before you start. The, the death of language and the death of art um, is a really serious subject at the moment because it's, it, it's, it's, it's threatened by social media and the rest of them, where people say what they already think. And what they already think is usually brutal and simple um, and, 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 and simply assertive. And art is not assertive. You can't write a novel that, that's going to last more than a page before your own eyes, let alone anybody else, that's assertive. You find out what you mean. And the more we live in a world of where language is used assertively, I think this, I think that, I believe that, I believe that. The more you, the more you need somebody somewhere in however small a pocket working on, working, making language discover things, find things out. Certainty is the killer. The certainty in our, in our age, I mean, you can put up with people 
but you can put up with people finding their way to views which you find you know, wrong or, or ugly, but it's the assertion of them. Um, we all know that we're all living at the assertion of this view is against that view, and you feel both views are wrong, not just because they are you know, logically and provably wrong, but they're wrong in the spirit, of the uh, severative spirit in which they are delivered, the aggressive spirit. So when I sit down to write a novel, I can at least feel that, that whatever is going to happen to it, I'm involved in something that I love. I'm not doing, it's not selflessness, I'm not doing it as a, a service for mankind, but I feel at least I'm involved in something that I, I don't have to be you know, ashamed of. I don't know who I am, I don't know what I mean, uh, and I'm going to find out. And I would, you know, if I could, if I were in charge of the world, I'd make everybody either paint or write music or write novels to find out. Not necessarily who they are, not, not, it's not that kind of thing. I needed to find out who I am, that's just egoism. I mean to just to find out what a meaning is. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, you've, you've touched on um, your passion actually for in politics, is there a possible novel coming out with your humour and your passion and what's going on now in our world, which clearly you don't like? Because I think there's fantastic stuff that could come from you in the future on a, a political novel with a bit of humour. Well, I wonder about, I've always said I, don't want to, I would never want to write a political novel and I don't read political novels, but in the sense of, you know, a novel that has a politic. A novel that knows, a novel that knows what it thinks politically is the kind of novel I mean. Um, and the trouble with satire, and I did try it in that, in a very brief way in that, in the novel Pussy, which I tried to, you know, push out of the way, which is, a, which is probably my most failed book, partly because I wrote it in, I wrote it in, in break, in, 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 in possibly short period of time, and I started writing it the night Trump, the very night, actually, that Trump was elected, because I woke up in the middle of the night, and I woke up, I'd gone to bed that night thinking, I think, it wasn't that I partic particularly wanted Hillary Clinton to win or anything, I just thought the world could not allow such a clown such a dimwit, I mean, it's a d dimwit. I mean, that, that when one says a dimwit, one doesn't take away from the brutality, but I thought such a dimwit could not possibly win this election. And when, when I discovered he'd won this election, I sat up bolt upright in my bed as though there was some malevolent imp at the bottom of my bed, and there was a malevolent imp on, <laughs> on the bottom of my bed. And I, and I woke my wife up and I said, the most terrible thing has happened. She says, I know about Brexit. I said, no, something even... <laughs> Something even, something almost as bad as that has happened. And she said, you will go mad unless you write about this. I used to have a column. I used to write a column for The Independent for, year, for 20 years, and then The Independent closed. I had no column. I thought, isn't this wonderful? I don't have to think of a column every week. And anyway, nothing interesting is happening in the world. <laughs> Two weeks later, we had a referendum, and there's kind of nine columns a day one wants to write now. And my wife said, you'll go mad unless you do some writing. So I started writing immediately a satire on Trump, and I thought I'd better get it written quickly, because he's not going to last more than a fortnight. I didn't think he'd get to the swearing in. I thought, I can't, there are enough people in America to go, come on, this is just stupid. Never mind the vote. You can't, sometimes you just can't listen to a vote. Sometimes you have to say to the people, I'm very, very sorry, but for your own sake, <laughs> for your sake, not for my sake, for your sake, you've got this wrong. Don't talk to me about the will of the people. I care about you, so, you know, you've got this wrong. I thought they would remove him. Just kind of quietly take him off. Um, so I thought I'd better get the, the novel out quick before that happened. And here he still is, it's amazing. So I wrote it in a few weeks, so I didn't do, but I don't know whether I would be any better if I wrote about now. I think I would, if I had to write about Corbyn and Boris Johnson, I think it would be, I would be ill. The, the thing is, <laughs> They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't do what Beryl did, which is to expand your... See, I know what I think of them, and to write about them would be against the very thing that I think a novel is for. I know what I think about them, and nothing would... At one point when I was writing, when I was writing um, Pussy, the, the Trump satire, I suddenly saw something. It suddenly started to stop. It suddenly started to become a novel and forget it was a satire, and I saw the moment in which my God, I could have some sympathy. I could have some sympathy for Trump here. 
And I thought, I've got to st that, that, that this has to stop. <laughs> a novel is a very important thing, but sympathy for Trump is beyond, the, <laughs> that's beyond the pale. So I couldn't allow that to happen. And if I couldn't have sympathy for, for, um, for Boris Johnson or, what's the other one called? Corbyn. Corbyn, <laughs> thank you. My, my age, you forget names. Um, I, couldn't have Trump, I couldn't have sympathy for either of those, so what would the novel, what would the novel amount to? I wouldn't like it. I've never met Corbyn. I've met Boris Johnson a couple of times. I've done a couple of events with Boris Johnson. It's quite chilling. <laughs> Boris Johnson, it's quite chilling because he doesn't know you're there. I've never noticed that with him, never seen that with another person before. It's as if you're not there. There's a kind of, and he got, there's a kind of an aura of ice around Boris Johnson. He's quite frightening. Um, even as you think he's funny and he's entertaining and all, not very funny actually, and not very entertaining actually, but even as he's being playful, there's this aura of ice. Have any of you read Little Dorrit? Surely some of you. There's a character in Little Dorrit, there's a thing in Little Dorrit called the, the Circumlocution Office. Yeah. Um, and the Circumlocution Office is the, is the office that um, is in charge of make, making sure that nothing works in the country. And there is a circumlocution officer with a lot of charm. And he comes to the hero of Little Dorrit, Arthur Clennam, in prison. And he says to and, and, and Arthur Clennam, who's a very good man, who's made some terrible mistakes and invested in a banker that no, that no one should have invested in. Um, it's a very modern novel, Little Dorrit, actually. Um, and he just says, what a fool you are. I'm really sorry for you, this, this, this bright circumlocution officer. And everything is a joke. And he smiles and beams, and it's utter charm, and it's the, there's a kind of poison of total cynicism beneath the charm. The total cynicism of somebody who uh, is clever enough to believe more than one thing, but actually doesn't believe in anything. And I would have thought the Johnson phenomenon is of somebody who actually doesn't believe in anything at all, which makes them quite fr So against somebody that be doesn't believe in anything at all, and someone like, what's his name again? Corbin. Corbin. <laughs> who only believes one thing. So you've got a person who only believes one thing, which you believed first in 1949 or something. <laughs> and people tell you it's a great virtue, you know, he's a, w he's a wonderful person. This, what's his name again? Corbin. <laughs> because he, you know, he hasn't, as though there's a virtue in not changing your mind. So you have someone who's never changed his mind in 60 years, and someone who doesn't have a mind to change, he just has something <laughs> else. You can see what kind of novel it would be. Actually, it's not sounding bad now. <laughs> now we can. I, I, th I think, Howard, you have to go away and write it and then come back next year and talk All right. about it. You want uh, me to do a quick one again, do you? <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and for the great questions and of course Howard for um, entertaining us so and if you haven't read um, Live a Little um, obviously you understand he had a great deal of fun writing it I had a great deal of fun reading it but I also shed tears a couple of times so it's highly recommended. Howard will be signing, as I said, in the Edinburgh Gin Cafe and signing tent and if you give us a moment to get there before you we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.